do you have to do oh, okay hello everyone hi this is the best time of the day to relax and <laughs> see something interesting so um, before I get started the uh, I wanted to request uh, one thing is um, my United flight changed times and I pretty much have to shrink this presentation uh, just by 10 minutes. So I do encourage uh, questions uh, as we are going through the various um, points in the topic and um, uh, if we have more time at the end of the presentation. The whole point is let's find collaborators, let's get some good feedback and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions now or follow up with you later. So what are we talking about today? Um, so the previous presentation, if you were there, uh, was very uh, good from the perspective of defining virtual versus physical infrastructure. And today we are basically looking into the platform as a part of um, an identity management system. So that's the key point, is um, when we want to have better transparency and visibility into a platform to be able to make access control decisions, uh, there needs to be an easy to use mechanism to do it. So the question is how do you figure out what are the platform attributes given the virtual infrastructure today and how do you link it with user attributes to make user uh, access control decisions. So here are some of my proposals. Actually I, I bet the pointer works, right? Okay. So what we have here is um, my proposal is let's work find uh, collaboration points to uh, design a comprehensive federa federated identity management system which includes platform attributes and um, also look at interacting with the keystone authentication mechanism. I was just talking here, you know, with, uh, there's a multi-factor initiative that we started looking into and uh, if there is a way to hook in the platform attributes then that would be of very interesting. Um, so to the basics, what do we have typically? Typically people talk about user attributes, username, password, 99% of the case. Then the more interesting ones become like biometrics which are very hardware dependent so there's a huge problem of interoperability but then there are PKI certs which have been talked about, uh, people's demographic information, their preferences. Um, even things like usage history, uh, things like reputation of you know where have you been, it's becoming very good part of your social media. But then there's a huge other set of attributes which are associ associated with you and that's related to the devices, one or more set of devices that you use. So it could be the location of your device, it could be the sensors on your device of what, what are the different types of sensors that you have associated in your device. It, and a very, the first thing that probably came to your mind when you read about this was the TPM, the various registers in the TPM. How do you leverage the information stored there to make um, some uh, evaluation of trust on that system? Uh, there are other things related to uh, certificates which are related to the device itself. So you can have keys burnt on the system or certificates issued to a certain hardware uh, which may imply something about that system and the service that you're going to offer. And then of course the whole software, st the, the software stack and all everything below it, the firmware, the BIOS, uh, wh what are the capabilities of the platform that you may want to leverage. You may also have systems, uh, the previous speaker which talked about isolation which was really good to understand what are the capabilities of the platform that can guarantee some level of isolation of your workload so that there is non-interference, there is more security, nobody's attacking. Um, so there are some very big implications about these various types of at, uh, device attributes. Any questions? Who else is catching a flight with me? <laughs> so the whole point is we've, consider, we've always considered uh, user attributes and uh, device attributes separately. But let's really, this is something is not novel, many people have been talking about it, but we, ne we need to find a really good mechanism to get to this point right here, you know, the user and device attributes interplaying with each other and have a nice anchor 
uh, to the um, device itself so that there is a way to enforce that this particular device attribute and user attributes are linked together. And depending on the type of service, you can figure out uh, what is the set of information that you really need. So a trustworthy mechanism to be able to retrieve this information and uh, a usable method, that is by using our identity management system, to be able to use it in our access control systems. That will have huge implications on the security, the privacy, and the usability of the system. And here is a list of, a I, one could go into each one of them and you know, we could spend a lot of time, but I think the audience here is very uh, advanced, so you, you can probably translate a lot of those points into uh, things that you're working on. So there's a huge amount of work which has been done in attribute-based access control. I think there are folks here who have led initiatives. I think the whole point is that in an attribute-based access control, uh, which has mostly uh, covered the top area, let's ha see how it integrates with the device attributes to better enhance the security, preserve privacy, without compromising the usability of the system. Any questions? Okay. So one thing which I want to point out over here is that uh, oftentimes we, uh, we say that I only care about this application and the user attributes. But it is very important to know, at the end of the day, the behavior of the system hosting this application and this user. Because at, uh, there is a root of trust which is established uh, during, um, uh, during a system boot up or when this application is running on the system, where you have to really depend on something um, that, is, um, that can provide you a certain level of guarantee on how the device is behaving. So I have an example here which will help understand the progression. So you can divide services into these four types. There's services which are free, you know, which really don't care about uh, users, user ID or the device, uh, and that's most of the time when you're surfing the web. But then uh, there might be uh, applications which require a high assurance on user identification. So you do uh, multi-factor authentication using, um, using device, uh, user, you know, strong user name, password, um, and there are yet another type of service where the user doesn't matter, uh, but you really do care about what device it is. You know, Blu-ray is a very easy example. But just see the difference where, you know, where there is relevance of user information or there's relevance of device information. But as we go to high assurance services where something like a healthcare application, um, where you do care about the user information for sure because you need to get to the right record, you know, if it's your uh, pharmaceutical um, service which is being offered online, you need to make sure that it is this right user's electronic medical record. But also, you need to make sure that the device is secure because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that the device um, is not being attacked by malware. So there's a certain amount of isolated environment provided by this healthcare application. And also that the residual data that is generated because of this whole e-pharma in this particular case interaction is also protected. So we want to make sure that if such an application denoted here in green is interacting with the cloud service, if it's in a hostile environment, there is some set of guarantee that the platform beneath is providing the support needed uh, to secure this application. Any question? So uh, what do we have here? Um, I have just two more slides. So this is going to be, um, I'm hoping to get more feedback uh, because I think the point is very clear, is that we, uh, we started off with uh, you know, basic authentication mechanisms within OpenStack. There are a lot of good plans about integrating. I'm sorry? Uh, okay, so I attended your talk. <laughs> about the various Keystone uh, initiatives, and there's some great work happening there. And um, the, the point is that as we progress, there are certain design requirements uh, when, when we start including different types of attributes, very much looking into the attribute-based access control to make it less hard to incorporate a bunch of attributes as you progress. So every time you add a new sensor or you add a new type of attribute, then we shouldn't have to go back and redo a bunch of those um, you know, your components. 
Um, but there's a crawl walk run. So there's, there, are two, there are two key pieces. One is, this is a very typical, at least identity provider, service provider, but it's a typical identity management system. Consider Ping, Shibboleth, a bunch of others. And um, I, I, I think there are initiatives which are looking into integrating with them. The piece that I was very interested in is how can you locally add certain platform attributes as you're building the local authentication system and then how it would integrate with the identity management system that exists today. One key component is this device verification services, which is important to um, have a logical distinction because oftentimes people don't know what to do with that data. Device attributes are not very easily understood. So what if I have a Zen versus KVM versus something else? Is there some mapping of more secure, less secure? And these are things that I think um, the policies and uh, translation of the information that you get from the device to actual information um, would be uh, another key uh, initiative. Which one? The part where you. Um, right. So there's a uh, there is some initial work like the whole TCG type initiative where you're looking at um, what is your trusted computing base. But I think there is a lot more to it where um, I was starting to understand when we look at loopholes in a certain hy hypervisor versus a certain platform. That is vulnerability management piece that is uh, need to be developed. There's another piece which talks about capabilities. You know, certain platform have certain capabilities where you can have higher assurance that um, my random number generator has a certain strength uh, or my iso degree of isolation is enforced by the hardware or not. So uh, from crypto, non-crypto, there are a lot of various um, uh, things that have been discussed earlier uh, which can impact the decision on how trustworthy a certain application is. So there are things in the industry, but there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done. Okay, we can come, okay. Yes. That's an excellent point. So the question was, uh, do you presume that the uh, attributes are static or, um, I mean, what about the dynamic ones which change over time? So there's some really good work on within the attribute-based access control community where they talk about static and the attributes which change over time. So the, you know, things like date of birth or you know, user attributes which uh, don't, you know, unless there's a correction, they don't change. But the most of the time, the attributes, there's a whole, at management system which needs to be updated, revoked, you know, corrected, the quality of the data being collected, and the whole privacy aspect to it, that is number one. Um, there's a, the revocation, there's a lot of work that has been done, at least in research, where, which talks about how do you revoke um, an attribute which is collected. So definitely these attributes which are being considered are dynamic, you know. There's, there's a system state in the beginning which may change uh, once the system has already The consumption, the policies, making sure, you know, what it means, you know, why is something more trustworthy than the other is definitely in a, a separate major piece of work that uh, is ongoing, but it really requires a lot of good collaboration and defining to do. Agree. 100%. And the dynamic part is definitely there too. Uh 
how much stress? Right. So we need to separate out the providing of those attributes versus evaluation of those attributes and what it means to my system. You can take a bunch of you know, the metadata that you may be adding with the various attributes. You can use the, them as a data point to build your own formula for confidence or um, which tier does your set of attributes fall into. So there is some uh, work in policies which have been done to be able to collect uh, a certain level of attributes, a language which says that, okay, if you have these attributes issued by the whole provenance of where this attribute came from, and then uh, translate it into a certain category. Um, so there has to be some simplifying mechanism for it to scale. So that is one of the things um, that I, uh, we can talk about in just one minute, but there's a whole policy and scale aspect, which uh, is a huge amount of focus that needs to be done to be able to really use this information. So uh, as you said, we can provide the information, but to be able to leverage it to the maximum, you need to have this verification mechanisms and also translation to trust uh, levels, what is trusted and not. And such a platform-based attribute uh, uh, attributes can also give you uh, different types of applications. I have been very involved in the standard space where uh, there's a requirements coming from, um, from understanding where is the uh, server located? What are the various um, hardware features that a certain uh, client may have? So there may be some requirements from the standard side. Also, there might be some compensating controls. You know, there might be certain requirements for anti-malware, for instance. But if you have a compensating control where you say, hey, but this is isolated and I can say something about this environment, then there might be some new policies that may um, help you achieve the goal without having to you know, have only one way of implementing things. So there's a standards compliance space, excellent piece that you can do from the audit end. It's really very interesting of how you can use this metadata into and plug it into, you know, for example, the CSA audit uh, and understand how uh, you can evaluate um, the compliance of a certain infrastructure uh, based on this information. The other pieces which are like sensor based, you know, I, one of the reasons that uh, people may think about biometric authentication not being so useful remotely is because you really don't know what, where this, um, how trustworthy is the sensor that is capturing this information. So biometric authentication, there's some trust that can be established on the device. Then you have, um, th there's this end to end trust, you know, where you not only trust the user because the user has certain capabilities on the platform, but I can be sure that there are folks from everywhere over here. You can talk about which geo do you want your um, workload to be, um, or the kind of policies that may be associated with uh, a certain a physical location. So, so there might be some uh, physical aspects of your policies that can be uh, enforced by this mutual trust mechanism. And finally, with this metadata or these platform attributes associated with user attributes, there are some very nice things that can happen from the fraud detection purposes. You know, somebody's logging onto my account from none of my devices from um, India or somewhere else at the same time as me. It just gives you a better, a little bit less spoofable uh, mechanism of um, 
providing such security services. I see a smile there. <laughs> so call to action. Essentially, what we discussed, what I want to get away from this presentation is um, understanding your interest. I think we have had some great questions about what would be the next first steps, you know, understanding static versus dynamic attributes, looking at um, how can these attributes be used in, as part of the multi-factor authentication uh, effort that is going on. Uh, the next step would be to do the backend, the verification services, integrating it into the um, uh, identity management systems that exist today. And finally, which is really the hectic part of it, is the policies and how it would scale. I think that's the toughest. While there are some really nice researchy uh, solutions out there, really understanding what works, what scales, uh, what is a usable m uh, method that we can uh, develop, which can be used um, by this, you know, OpenStack is in such a good position to make an impact from that manner, where you're kind of building things right from scratch, like, and um, there's, a potent, there's an opportunity here to uh, learn from what we've learned in the identity management space, from the trusted computing space, and really building something good uh, with all the various applications that, um, um, that we just talked about. So any takers for blueprint collaboration, you know, any kind of uh, interest from the policy, you know, GRC type work, um, would really welcome that. So, open to any further questions? Oh, we are on time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, I wanted to go to David's talk too, a lot. <laughs> um, so I think uh, one of the things that we want to do is at least connect, uh, if you can email me please. I have the longest email that I think anybody has in the conference. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we can make a, a collab, we can at least connect and define the interest and we go from there, from design phase and then we have folks who are interested in the implementation too. It's a lot of work we're doing on the identity management space. Yeah, I think that's the best part, right? You can get a lot of information. Uh, the, I really s didn't stress on the trustworthy aspect as much, is because um, some of the mechanisms, and I really didn't get into the details here, but the way you get the platform information is in a manner which is cryptographically you know, enforced. So the in information cannot be forged very easily. So if you are storing this information that you're getting from the platform about the entire stack, about various credentials that led to the fraud detection, then um, you can probably dig into that database with high assurance and know that the information is correct based on the keys and Yeah, there's a huge amount of, there's a nice initiative from uh, McAfee, for instance, you know, with the Global Trust uh, GTI. What is it? I for, I forget. Initiative or infrastructure, one of those two. Huh? So essentially, there, there is work where this huge amount of logs which are generated, uh, how do you, um, like, principal component analysis, right, <laughs> where you take the most significant information and are able to, the point is you can do roll up and drill down. So essentially, you can, take uh, bits and pieces of information, um, you know, if you s suspect something is going wrong, unless you have already, you know, uh, deleted the log, there is a way to um, go down the right thread, right? Where you can track down and say, okay, I really need to get to this log. Otherwise, there are mechanisms which have been developed over so, uh, which have been taking the summary data, so to say, um, at various levels to come to a point where the root of the tree says, okay, I have high confidence that something is wrong here. So we can look into some 
mechanisms which are out there. Oh yeah. Right, right. The de-identification of the data, uh, how, how to make sure that, for example, if you're doing trials, um, a huge amount of trials on user health, that's something I looked at. So a person who's born to, when they grow, it says, oh, you know, when you were born, they injected you with something, and then 20 years later, there is certain disease which is found. So can you track down? Uh, how, how far do you go without compromising privacy? So th there is certain amount of work. All the answers are not here, but uh, I think that's one very interesting area of how, how do you aggregate logs, how do you make sense of it, the whole big data issue. And uh, there's another piece of it which says, can we uh, incorporate device data into this mix, right? Can we somehow uh, have an easy mechanism of retrieving uh, device data um, to have greater assurance of um, user information or if device was sufficient, as we talked about the various use cases, we can um, use them just the way we use user attributes. But excellent point. I think there's, um, it may, may not, depending on what the thing is. So for example, um, if you think about um, some premium content. Actually, ca can you? So yeah, if you can please repeat or I can help. Coming to the point about device and a device attribute being important, it does when you want to say, I want to look at my photographs from my iPhone or my laptop, but it, it kind of disappears when you're doing like really server loads of work of data crunching and things like that. So the, when you do, um, I think uh, th that would be a good thing to check like as part of data mining things where it doesn't matter exactly I'll give an example. It doesn't matter what exact device you had sometimes, but the fact it was the same device, you know, or for example, all Zen uh, hypervisors were, you know, leading to certain uh, behavior or something like that. So you may not want to uniquely identify something, but you may want to group certain device attributes to learn something about the system as well. So case by case, I think that would be something really good to understand which use cases exist. And I think that's a great idea is to take, um, understand which use cases, where is device attributes relevant, where it is not, um, based on the usage model. Anything else? Okay, so if you have any further questions, please let me know. I'm sorry for the rush rush. Uh, it's United, it's United Airlines fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs>